Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about how there's no such thing as the easiest or hardest language. But first, this is a reminder that we're giving out a grant for a linguistics communication project. So if you have an idea of something that you want to communicate about linguistics and $500 would help you do it, you can go to lingcom.org, that's two M's as in communication, to find out details about applying for that grant. Applications are due June 1st, any time zone in the world. We're funding one grant, which is very exciting, but if we make our next Patreon goal, by the end of April, we will be able to give out three Lincom grants instead of one. Plus, if you join Patreon by the end of April, you can get a sticker or a mug sent to you at higher tiers. So there's an extra incentive for you and also help this grant happen. We're also very excited to be able to announce that we're giving out an additional sponsored Lincom grant, thanks to a research grant from Claire Bowen, which will be a grant specifically related to minoritized languages and linguistics communication. So if you have an idea for a linguistics communication project that's specifically related to minoritized languages, you have an extra incentive to apply. The general Lincom grants are open to projects on any aspect of linguistics, including minoritized languages, but this one is specifically directed to that. So we may be giving out up to four grants if we both hit our funding goal and with this new one. It's very exciting times. I'm very excited to have more linguistics in my life, correction. I'm very excited to see all the cool projects that people come up with. Do people ever ask you, Lauren, as a linguist, you know, what's the easiest language I should be learning, or what's the hardest language I should be learning? I say this crop up quite a lot with people kind of crunching the numbers on how much effort they're going to need to invest in learning a language based on its difficulty. And it's a really difficult question to unpack. I feel like people just want an answer. They just want you to say, oh, of all the 7,000 languages, it's just this one. That's the answer. Definitive. I feel like they want, like, you know, this one, you can learn it in a month, you don't have to put any effort in, then you'll be completely fluent and, like, there will be no effort required. Uh, it'll be like, you know, learning how to boil an egg or something. Yeah, and instead of a definitive answer from me, they just get, well, this is a <laughs> fascinating question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer that I always give is because it's it's kind of it's kind of trite but it it works in a short context is that it's like asking where is the furthest away because my answer to that furthest away question is going to be very different maybe from your answer because I'm in Montreal and you're in Melbourne <laughs> and we have different starting points for yeah for what counts as furthest away for sure well, I don't know. Alpha Centauri is pretty far away from both of us. I don't know if the difference between Montreal and Melbourne really stacks up when you start talking about light years. But that being said, uh, you know, if we stay on the globe, we're definitely far away from different points. And I think the same thing goes for languages. Depending on what you already speak, you can find different languages easier or harder to learn because there are some things you already know or you take for granted. But also, Gretchen, one of the things I love about language is that it operates on all these different levels. And so a lot of the comparisons that you see among languages are based on their lexical similarity, so how similar the words are in those languages. But you could have languages with very different words and, and have to learn completely new words, but the language that you're learning might have kind of features of grammar that are very familiar to you in your language, even if it's from a completely different family, or it might have... Yeah, sounds that are really familiar to you that are that are easy for you to produce or something, because you already know how to make them. Yeah. You could have a language like English and then a language which has words which are technically, lexically really similar. You have words that are technically really similar, but the language has undergone a sound change that makes it actually more cognitive effort for you to learn than a language with completely different words. Yeah, like I find it easier to kind of get vocabulary for free going between Romance languages because more of the sound changes that have happened between vocabulary items there have to do with vowels, it feels like. Uh, whereas going between Germanic languages, the things that have changed between words there are, tend to be consonants. And so it feels like the, the differences are more opaque, even though you can reconstruct, you know, similarities, uh, in terms of vocabulary on both, from both places. But when you're just kind of shuffling to a neighbor language, there's the tendency to just kind of assume you can guess your way through the vocabulary, which can sometimes lead to just as many problems communicatively as just requiring yourself to learn new vocabulary for a language. 
And the other thing is, is like vocabulary is actually something that adults are really good at learning because, you know, we learn new words our entire lives. The average adult learns about one new word a day on average for your entire lifespan. And this doesn't stop anywhere. There's no point where you like stop learning new words. This goes for the entire lifespan. And so adults are really good at assimilating new vocabulary items, being like, oh, here's a new word. Here's another new word. Like, here's another new word. Adults have an easier time with this potentially than learning new sounds or learning new bits of grammar. I can totally believe this. It takes me a really long time to get my head around kind of a grammatical variation and, and borrowing a new bit of always feels like a really conscious effort. Whereas if I see a new word, like little shiny things that I just immediately appropriate. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you probably learned a new word pretty regularly. If you pick up a new hobby, I've started watching The Great Pottery Throwdown. Oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> and I've been picking up all of this pottery related vocabulary that I didn't have before. You must be definitely exceeding a word a day, like a word an episode in that. Right. So I've learned like slip and throwing that have these technical meanings and raku, which is this firing technique. And, uh, you know, here's all this pottery related vocabulary that I didn't have a week or two ago. And yeah, adults are really good at picking up new vocabulary, and it's not that much more difficult to pick up new vocabulary in a different language. It's a you know, similar sort of thing, like, here are some new words, I can just learn them. You know who's really slow at picking up vocabulary? Like a six-month-old. Like, <laughs> three months later, still often, like, no words, would fail a vocabulary test. Yeah, and this is the interesting thing, because a lot of times you get this sort of perception, oh, well, kids, they're so good at learning language. And yet, by a lot of metrics, like, kids get exposed to language for, like, a whole year before they say, like, one word. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I know I'm being very unfair on the kids. They're doing a lot of, like, processing, and their brain is, like, literally being built uh, as they're being exposed to language. But if we were giving out vocabulary They tests, still have to figure out they have a body and stuff. <laughs> like, they have to figure out they have a tongue, they have to figure out they have hands, they have to learn how to oh do, like, gosh. a lot of this stuff. Adults just have so many advantages. <laughs> right, but adults can go to, like, a one-hour language class or spend, like, you know, ten minutes on a language learning app, and they come away with a couple words, and that's way faster than the kids are doing. So this gets us into this bigger question of when it comes to is a language hard or is it easy, there's a big difference between kid preferences and adult preferences. And the things that adults think are hard, so like learning sounds that you're not familiar with, kids are born with the ability, assuming that they have normal hearing, they're born with the ability to differentiate between any sound that's relevant for any of the world's languages. And they actually lose that ability as they get older. And then if you want to try to regain it, you have to do a lot more kind of conscious effort and training to get it back. So, you know, they have this advantage when it comes to learning sounds, even though they're spending all this time and not learning any words, but they're learning how to dis distinguish between sounds. We talked in the episode on phonology about the kids who spent the early months of their life in Korea, and then even though they retained no Korean, still those sounds were able to be – like, the, the phonology was being activated when they did studies with them years later, and they'd been adopted to countries and spoke English and – had not been exposed to Korean anymore. But it's just so embedded in those early months of language acquisition. Yeah, their brains still light up. And, you know, I think, you know, adults may be able to eventually sort of get at least some sounds. I know there are some sounds that I've learned how to produce at a bit of an older age, but it can be a lot harder. Another thing that adults often have more difficulty with is learning specific kinds of bits of grammar. So adults are really good at learning, okay, here's, again, here's another word. Here's this word for this grammatical thing. Like, here's a word that makes something into a question. And adults like, great, I learned the question word. Like, you know, here's here's ma, which is a question particle in Mandarin, which I'm going to definitely say with the wrong tone because I missed my critical period for tones. Um, <laughs> like, here's this question particle. It makes a statement into a question. Great. I've learned this. This is a really easy concept for an adult. Whereas kids seem to be keener on learning more grammar, more little bits of words that stick onto each other and provide this extra sort of redundancy. Mm. Because the task that kids have to do is different from the task that adults have to do. Adults are already familiar with like the concept of what a word is. And when you're being introduced to new words in a second language, you're often being introduced to them sort of one at a time. Like, here's the word for dog, here's the word for cat, here's the word for table, you know. But the problem that kids have is they don't even have any concept of like what a word is at all. So they're not super keen on learning words. They have to figure out this different problem, which is segmenting the speech stream into meaningful units at all. 
And so for kids, it's super helpful to have as much redundancy and repetition and extra things going on in that speech stream. For example, like one of the things that second language learners often complain about when learning another language is, why do you have things like agreement in a language? So if, you know, if the noun is feminine, why does the adjective also have to be feminine? If I say the big table, why does big and table, why do they have to have the same ending to agree with each other? Because that's like one extra thing for the adult to keep track of. Whereas kids learning in less of a classroom situation are just like, oh my gosh, thank goodness, that makes it so much easier for me. Yeah. More. I want more agreement. I want more of this dense stuff. Kids love this stuff. Ah. Because it helps them figure out what the relevant stuff is going on in the whole stream of speech. Because we don't talk, we don't actually talk in words. I know this seems very counterintuitive, right? But like, we talk in just like a whole bunch of sounds that just kind of come out. And you have to figure out where one word starts and where another word ends. And so if you have all of these prefixes or suffixes on your words, like beginnings and ending bits, then the kid can say, ah, I know this must be the beginning of a new word because it's got a prefix on it. Or I know this must be the end of a word because it's got a suffix. So if your nouns and your adjectives all end in A or something so that they are agreeing with each other, the kid can be like, aha, I found the boundaries between these words because I have a bunch of stuff ending in A and it's going to be easier for me. I am delighted to know that I get to add another parameter when people are like, which language is the most difficult? I'll be like, well, we can also factor in whether you're a child or an adult. Yeah. And this is the thing. There's this perception of like, oh, like, why is this language even doing this if it's so difficult? Well, it's doing it because every language fundamentally has to be learnable by children if you want it to get passed on to another generation. And kids love this stuff. <laughs> So there's a couple interesting studies looking at language structure in relation to social structure and looking at especially differences between languages that are spoken in larger communities where a lot of the speakers don't already know each other mm -hmm. and where you have speakers joining this speech community as adults who are learning this language as a second language versus languages that are spoken in smaller communities where people tend to already know each other and where virtually everybody in the speech community learns the language as a child. Right. So that's the social structures. And then you combine that with what we've just learned about children preferring uh, more bits of words, more morphology, more complex grammatical stuff, and adults not preferring this as much. And you can see where we're going with this, right? <laughs> I feel like this has implications for the relationship between like the structure of the language and the kind of cultural context in which it's spoken. Yeah. So there's this study by Gary Lupian and Rick Dale from 2010, and it's called Language Structures Partly Determined by Social Structure. It's a very concise title. And they did an analysis of over 2,000 languages using demographic sources and the World Atlas of Language Structures. And they noticed that languages that are spoken in smaller communities where you don't have adult learners, all the learners are mm -hmm. child learners, tend to have more morphological stuff going on. They've got more prefixes and suffixes and endings on words and inflectional things and agreement and all of that sort of stuff, That stuff that adult learners feel is complicated. <laughs> but the kids like it. So, for example, we have languages like Murimpata in Australia, which has really rich morphology, which, because speakers are more likely to acquire this language as children or be exposed to this language as children, has been more likely to have this rich morphology compared to a language like English or maybe um, like Mandarin, where because they're large languages that are used by people who speak them as children, but people who acquire them as adults and have done for many centuries, this may be some way related to the fact that they are less rich in this kind of grammatical information. Yeah. And so you can look at this even within Germanic languages. So English has more individual words that do grammatical things than it does stuff on bits of words that are attached to each other that do grammatical things, even compared to other Germanic languages. And the time period when this happened, like English lost a lot of its grammatical inflection, was when you had a lot of second language learners who were originally speaking, you know, Norse or were originally speaking Norman French in the Middle Ages. You had a lot of people learning English as a second language uh, who were originally speaking Norse or originally speaking Norman French. And that was also around the period when you had a lot of endings in English that were being dropped off. And maybe part of the reason was that the second language speakers didn't like learning all of the endings. 
I guess, as always, with these big data crunching studies, um, you'll always find languages that kind of go against the flow that are, you know, maybe like Finnish and very grammatically rich, but also still languages of large nations and languages that don't have this complexity of the grammatical system, but are spoken in small communities. And that's why you look at large samples of multiple thousands of languages and look at the tendencies rather than individual languages. Right. And there are things that can stop that too. So one of their examples was Russian, which was learned by a lot of second language speakers. But there was this tradition in Russian of like teaching the grammar very overtly. And so a lot of the prefixes and suffixes that might have been lost otherwise got kept around because they were being taught very explicitly. And you get another piece of this puzzle of, you know, what makes a language easy or difficult or what makes a language complex or not is that there's another study from 2018, which is called Simpler Grammar, Larger Vocabulary, How Population Size Affects Language. And they find that languages in smaller communities that have a lot of stuff going on with the morphosyntax, with the prefixes and the suffixes and, and affixes and stuff like that, also tend to have smaller vocabularies. Whereas languages that have less going on with the morphosyntax, and are spoken in larger communities also tend to have larger vocabularies. So there may also be some sort of trade-off in terms of vocabulary size, which again might not surprise us because adults are good at learning words. And I think this also goes to the like juggling the different layers of language in this discussion of difficulty is that if a language tends to be very complex in one area, it may be less complex in others to offset that because all languages more or less convey the same amount of information in more or less the same amount of communication. It's not like there's one language where people can say the same thing in 10 seconds that it takes speakers of other languages to say in like a whole minute consistently. There might be some ways that some languages are more efficient, but there's no language that is like the most efficient on every level. Right, exactly. Like there's a lot of trade-offs that a language makes. And ultimately, a language has to be speakable by humans. We know that humans have, you know, essentially the same sorts of brains and that they have to be learnable by children and adults are often able to learn a language as well. And it has to accomplish the types of things that humans need to do. I think it's also interesting to think, like, can anything be done about this tendency that adults have? Okay, well, if adults are good at words, can anything be done about adults having more difficulty with learning new sounds or having more difficulty with learning new grammatical constructions? And there's one interesting study about sounds in particular from 2002, and they had adults sit down in front of a computer with headphones, and they were played two different sounds that they weren't good at distinguishing between based on their first language, right? or based on any languages they already spoke. Mm -hmm. And they had them press a button for like, which one is which sound? And as expected, the adults were really bad at this because it was a sound that they didn't know how to distinguish. And an hour later, after doing this <laughs> torturous experiment, they were still bad at it. Shock. Horror. <laughs> uh, then they had them redo this experiment, or it was a different group, and it was the same task of they had to press a button for which sound it was, but this time they gave them immediate feedback after every single button press for whether they'd gotten it right or gotten it wrong. Right. And then now, within an hour, the adults actually got pretty good. They got up to 80% accuracy rather than like 50-50, even in unfamiliar words. And in a similar study, they began even pronouncing these sounds better because they just got all this training. I came across this a number of years ago and I was like, gosh darn it, why can't I download an app on my phone that like does this for me for any pair of sounds? Does this experiment. Right. They should have just packaged up their experiment and started selling it to people <laughs> as a language learning. Right, like why doesn't this exist? Because if I'm trying to learn this distinction, I just need something that gives me this feedback. And if, yeah, if I could invest an hour into doing this and then now I'm able to like hear the difference between like a retroflex T and a non-retroflex T, like this would be really useful for me. I don't know why this doesn't exist. Like somebody get on that free, uh, free app idea. <laughs> but yeah, so like there is hope for adults, maybe if we can figure out the right tasks for them to really target those specific types of things. Like having an app like that, that would prompt you and, and make you feel motivated ties into what is a massive area of literature within language acquisition studies, which is the area of motivation which obviously many things I like about linguistics, but one of the things I really like is that you think you're studying language and how it works, and then you get to like read a whole bunch about like the linguistics and psychology of motivation in language learning, because it's a whole 
field into itself. And it's obviously, it has a, a big implication because if you can understand how motivation works in acquiring languages, you can look at what makes a language easier or harder to learn, not in terms of the language itself, but in terms of how much a person can bring to learning it. So this is the basic idea that like, if I'm really excited to learn French and I want to learn it and I have French friends who I want to talk to, then I'm going to be more likely to learn it faster than somebody else who isn't excited to be in a French classroom, doesn't have any French people they want to talk to, isn't excited to do that. And this seems like it might be kind of self-fulfilling. Like, if I'm excited to learn a language, I'm going to go out and find more exposure for it, I'm going to go find music to listen to in it, or I'm going to go watch movies in it because I'm excited about it. But there's other factors beyond that, right? Yeah, one of the distinctions that I really like is Bonnie Norton's discussion of the relationship between motivation and investment. So motivation is all those things you talked about in terms of, you know, how integrated the language is in my experiences, my attitude towards the the learning situation, any anxieties that I have around learning, but also it looks at investment as part of do I feel like this learning experience is aligning with my identity as a person who wants to learn this language? And and not just in like terms of the like language learning part, but as your whole identity. So if you are in a classroom situation where the teacher actually draws on other parts of your life and your experience to make that classroom a welcome experience for like you as a whole person – that's going to help you, you know, irrespective of your motivation. You could be the most motivated person in the world to learn. Um, you know, I think a lot about like Latin and why people don't like learning Latin a lot of the time is because they can come thinking that they have all this motivation to learn Latin and then they get to the classroom and there's all the stereotypes about like you just sit there and have to learn verb conjugations and there's no like interest in the classroom and connecting that with anything else you're interested in. Or this idea of like, oh, you need to read about like Caesar's wars. And if you don't care about Caesar's wars, then you're like, well, why am I even doing this? Is that the the idea there? Yeah. So an interesting kind of case study about this. So I've been, you know, playing with mm -hmm. languages through Duolingo, like as you do these days. And uh, I was looking at Dutch. And because of that, I started following some Dutch linguists on Twitter. Uh, and it was really great because they'd be posting about linguistics, which is obviously a thing that I care about and I find interesting, uh, but in Dutch. And so I like wanted to find out what they were saying because here's this topic that I care about and I can find out stuff that's going on or I can guess what they're saying because I already know things about linguistics and be like, oh, they're probably talking about this thing because I have this certain background. Whereas if, if I was trying to take the generic advice of like, oh, follow some like Dutch local news channel that's going to talk about, like, I don't know, transportation policy in Amsterdam or something. Like, I just don't know if I care about transportation policy in Amsterdam the same sort of way. You are much less invested, I would say. Right. Yeah, I'm much less invested in, in like, are they going to put another bike lane in than I am in, like, what's this person saying about linguistics? And you say this with students in classrooms when they're given, you know, projects that allow them to bring other skills in alongside just the language learning, if they're allowed to kind of bring other elements of their life or their identity into the language learning experience. And I think this goes really to the heart of some really interesting non-classroom based language learning contexts for second language learners, especially in the like minority language and language revitalization context. And in fact, the classroom in itself can be so isolating in terms of people's identity and therefore their investment that for a lot of language learning contexts, classrooms are actually not always helpful. Yeah, I'm thinking about this in terms of like learning languages in the classroom. Like when I was in high school and I was learning French and I was learning German. And so of course, like I was interested in learning all of like grammatical stuff and like learning the languages in the grammatical tradition really aligned with how I saw myself. So I wanted to learn all of that stuff. But definitely not everybody who learns a language wants to learn it for grammatical reasons or wants to learn it to become a linguist. Some people want to like talk with their grandmother and the language learning classroom isn't necessarily conducive to that. Yeah, and this is super relevant to the language revitalization context. I remember you talked with Ake Nichols about this. Yeah, I did an interview with Ake Nicholas for Lingthusiasm previously about like language learning in language revitalization contexts. 
And one of the things that she talked about was having students make videos and like tell stories about aspects of pop culture that they were already invested in, rather than telling them that they had to learn about like the traditional stories in order to access the language. She said, let's meet them where they are with the pop culture and have them do that in the language as well. Not just you have this double barrier of you need to learn the folklore and you need to learn the language at the same time. You know, maybe the language can eventually be a gateway to the folklore, but for the moment you can also use it to talk about, you know, globalized pop culture, like Disney movies or Dumbledore, you know, Harry Potter, these kinds of things as well. You can you can use it to talk about multiple domains and let's find a domain that the students are already interested in. I really appreciate Ake's commitment to thinking about the student's whole identity as, you know, speakers or heritage speakers of this language as well as people who consume pop culture. Yeah, and it's nice to sort of say that those things don't have to be in tension with each other. And even beyond the classroom, you have language learning situations in what are known as either master apprentice language learning programs or language nests, which really focus on communication. They're less focused on overt grammar teaching. And it's a space where you have more experienced speakers of the language spending time with people who are trying to learn the language in really supportive and open and encouraging ways that really focus on identity-based interactions as well. So they're often really grounded in just spending time together. One of the examples that really stuck with me when I was reading a Leanne Hinton's book describing the, the Master Apprentice program, which I think is called How to Keep Your Language Alive, and I read it a number of years ago, and she was talking about activities that the mentor and apprentice can do with each other. Sometimes they're called mentor apprentice in the Canadian context because they're not super keen on master as a word, which like... Yeah, fair enough. It's from the idea of like a master, like shoemaker or something, but I can see why people might not like it as well. So you have the mentor doing something like, you know, everyday tasks, you know, doing laundry or chopping wood or cooking something. And the apprentice is going along with those tasks and you're talking about the tasks as you're doing them. And so partly it gives you concrete objects, you know, so if you're doing laundry, you can be talking about what the different items of clothing are called or what the different colors are. If you have to sort them for the laundry, if you're cooking, you can be talking about the different names of the food. So you have this very concrete setting, which the language learning classroom is often has this sort of decontextualized thing of like, maybe you have pictures of what you're talking about, but you don't necessarily have a lot of physical objects to talk about. So you can't recover the meanings of things from context as much. So you have the set of context, you can, you know, do some of the chores you need to get done, uh, which helps people fit it into their everyday lives as well. And you, you know, they start with when they do training for for these programs, um, sometimes you'll get people from a whole bunch of different languages coming together to do training for the mentor apprentice programs in general. And they'll often say, let's start out by learning a couple key phrases like, what's this and give me that and, you know, pick it up or give give me this or give me that. And different types of things that you can use in a lot of different contexts to sort of get your way into uh, the language and to, you know, give someone simple instructions, you know, put this here or something like that. And then you can build that up into put the shirt in the washing machine or something like that. You can, you can build that up into more complicated things, but they learn a few basic phrases that are really useful for actually like doing something together. So it's a, it's an interesting way of fitting a language learning into everyday life a bit more, making it less decontextualized, because the classroom is not <laughs> an ideal environment for learning a language. And a lot of people spend years in a classroom learning a language only to discover that when they go out on a street somewhere and they try to talk in the language, they don't have the sort of basic vocabulary you need on a street. You don't know how to say like, excuse me, or something like that when you're passing someone on the street, because you never had to learn that in the classroom. But you don't know how to say like, can I sharpen my pencil, which like I've never needed to say uh, since I left <laughs> the class room. So it it does give you this sort of artificial vocabulary. And if your motivations aren't aligned with the classroom already, you can find it even harder to have motivation to learn a language. I always love how my motivation tanks in a week in a classroom where the textbook doesn't align with a thing I feel like I'll ever do. <laughs> Just like, well, I'm never going to, you know, go shopping for a suit or go to the opera. Like, okay, like, sure. Even though, like, a lot of the vocabulary and the grammar is relevant, it doesn't, I guess, align with my identity. Yeah, and, like, when I was, you know, learning languages in school, I was always asking the teachers or the professors, like, how do I say linguist in this? Because they'd say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up or something? And I'd be like, linguist. And this was always a word that I remember in many different languages that I learned, <laughs> because it was this very important word for me. Whereas something like, okay, you know, am I going to become a race car driver or something? Like, no, I don't care about the parts of a car in English. Why do I care about them in another <laughs> language? 
I think there's also, uh, as English speakers, we're often coming into language learning from this sort of classroom-based perspective or this, you know, dictionary-based perspective of like, oh, I need to look up all the words for this. There's also the case of learning languages where you don't necessarily have a language in common already, or you don't necessarily have a dictionary that you can go look things up in, or you don't necessarily have a textbook that you can look things up in. And the Mentor Apprentice Program was one of the things that's designed to work in the circumstances where you don't necessarily follow a curriculum, you follow a life, and you start talking about the things in, in a life. Another case of that is what's called monolingual fieldwork. So when linguists are trying to figure out the grammar of a new language or how a new language works, and one type of fieldwork that happens is you have bilingual fieldwork where you have a speaker that already speaks a language you have in common, whether that's English or Spanish or Chinese or Arabic or another one of the, the big languages in the world, and a linguist can, can learn that in a conventional way and then come in and, and work with bilingual speakers. But in a monolingual context, and this was especially more common before globalization was quite as much of a thing, um, you have a linguist who's asking somebody about a language without sharing any language in common. And there's an interesting demonstration of this on YouTube with the language Hmong, where you have the linguist who's, you know, and both both people actually do speak English because this was in the US that I saw this demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was I was there when the video was recorded, but the linguist decides to speak a different language that the Hmong speaker doesn't have, and the Hmong speaker is, has been previously instructed, like, only speak Hmong. Um, and you can actually, you can communicate quite a bit. And so the linguist had, you know, some props, like a stick and a rock and stuff like that. And people are generally pretty good at understanding, like, this person's trying to communicate with me. Let me try to do my best effort to communicate back with them. And so you can do things like point to the stick or point to the rock or drop the stick or drop the rock or break the stick in half. And you can get, you know, okay, the speaker's saying something and we're not completely sure exactly what it means, but you can figure out, uh, okay, let's write this down. And then if you keep asking, so if you get the word for stick or the stick or one stick, you're not quite sure what, what it is. And then you get a word for rock or one rock or the rock or something like that. And then you have, I drop the stick, I drop the rock. Uh, or might just mean drop the stick or drop the rock. You can figure out which part means drop because it's the part that doesn't mean the thing you already identified as stick. The important thing about monolingual field methods is that it is obviously useful in a context where you don't have a language in common, but as a way of introducing yourself to the structure of a new language, it can be good because it can stop kind of uh, translation and accommodation effects happening. If you are working in a language that is a second language for both of you, you may be kind of interpreting what each other are saying through those languages. You know, there's a lot of encouragement to use these kind of field methods to avoid those translation effects. And so it can be effective in that way. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to make assumptions or you might be, uh, you know, like the language that you have as a common language might not have a lot of structural c properties in common with the language that you're interested in. And so, you know, you may be missing some of the structure if you're just translating it straightforwardly into, into some other language. So it can help avoid those assumptions. And it can also kind of get you in the habit of speaking as much of this other language as possible rather than falling back on this language you have in common because you're both more fluent in it together. So it can get you in the habit of maybe learning how to speak faster. When I was in Nepal, this happened with me a bit because I I have Nepali in common with the Yolmo speakers and Shuba speakers that I work with, and we would fall back on that a bit because the great thing about monolingual field methods is that it is a really great way to elicit data, and it is really great if you you, you get so much more insight and you obviously have a far richer experience if you spend your time talking to people in their first language. But the difficulty there in terms of being a language documenter and a language learner is that you can document things and write them down at a far quicker rate than your brain can integrate and process them. Yeah. Even if you have figured out, oh, this is how they do plurals without ever asking them overtly, um, you can be like, oh, this is how plurals get done. But then actually embedding that in your spoken competency can like lag way behind. <laughs> and so there are some things that I – have spent hundreds and thousands of words writing about and observing, and I am still really bad at using. <laughs> um, and so this is the kind of disjuncture as a language documenter and a language learner that I experience. Yeah, and definitely, like, one big factor for, you know, motivation for language learning is, oh, no, I won't be able to eat if I can't find out some way of conveying to people that I need to eat or 
you know, these other types of sort of basic uh, life events that are important. So if you yeah. keep yourself in this monolingual environment, then you have to figure out how to talk because you have to figure out how to convey, I need to eat now or something like this. But as someone doing language documentation, my motivations are, right, I have three more weeks and I still have to figure out how relative clauses act in the negative if there's also a conditional there. Um. <laughs> right. And so it may be more efficient to be like, okay, why don't I just like present you with some examples uh, in this language that we both speak and we can get more directly there rather than have to come up with the scenario in the language itself. Yes, but I still love monolingual methods and I still love trying to ground myself in that you know it's very if you have watched arrival um it's very much they were trying to broker this kind of monolingual method to an extent there disappointingly there's a um blog post on the nasa website that says that uh they think this face-to-face -face monolingual fieldwork context type activity will probably be the least likely scenario when we encounter extraterrestrial life. So uh, you just have to keep refining those skills for Earthbound <laughs> languages for now. I mean, I don't know, like, the Arrival movie did a pretty good job of, like, demonstrating how you could use monolingual fieldwork to communicate with aliens. So I think NASA should be investing some money into this. <laughs> The sort of flip side of, you know, getting better at, at language learning skills at a meta level is also that people who are fluent in a language already can get better at providing comprehensible input for people who are still learning the language. And that's a whole additional skill uh, that, you know, is part of the sort of meta skills when it comes to learning a language. Certainly. And I think regardless of whether a language is considered more difficult to learn or less difficult to learn or has more complex structures in some ways or less complex structures in other ways. I think just even try, like, I think sometimes we can get so concerned about like the difficulty of any language learning that we just forget that like any amount of language learning is still good. Anything that like fosters any amount of communication is still a completely valuable and enriching experience. There's this really great quote from Cato Lom's Polyglot, How I Learn Languages, that expresses this really well, which says, we should learn languages because languages are the only thing worth knowing even poorly. If someone knows how to play the violin only a little, he will find that the painful minutes he causes are not in proportion to the possible joy he gains from his playing. Solely in the world of languages is the amateur of value. Well-intentioned sentences full of mistakes can still build bridges between people. Asking in broken Italian which train we are supposed to board at the Venice railway station is far from useless. Indeed, it is better to do that than to remain uncertain and silent and end up back in Budapest rather than in Milan. And I think we can get too hung up with this question of what's easy and what's hard, and the effort itself is, is still really useful, even when it is hard. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. And you can help support the Lingcom grant and get special limited edition Lingthusiast stickers and mugs by going to patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, join our Discord chat room, help keep the show ad-free, and support the Lingcom grants, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include teaching linguistics, robo-lingthusiasm, and future English. Can't afford to pledge? That is okay too. We really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirala, and our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!